Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to today's show. Now, in November, there will be other choices for President of the United States other than Donald Trump and Joe Biden. As there has been for the past almost 50 years, the Libertarian Party will ha- also have a nominee. Now, my guest today is running for the Libertarian Party nomination. The party is supposed to select their candidate in Austin, Texas in May, if all goes well. So joining me today is Libertarian for President, Jacob Hornberger. Hey, Jacob, welcome to the show. Thank you, Robert. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. Um, let's go ahead and start out, for people that may not know who you are, um, start out with a little introduction. Who is Jacob Hornberger, what's your background, and why are you running for president? Okay, I, I, um, from Laredo, Texas originally, which is a town on the U.S.-Mexico border. I grew up on a farm that was uh, adjacent to the Rio Grande and uh, went to college at Virginia Military Institute, got a law degree at the University of Texas, and then returned to Laredo to practice law. And I practiced law for some eight years, um, I'm sorry, 12 years in um, in. Laredo and in Dallas, eight in Laredo and four in Dallas. And then uh, I got offered a job in New York at the Foundation for Economic Education, which was the country's first libertarian educational foundation. Stayed there a couple of years. And then in 1989, left there to start my own foundation, which is called the Future of Freedom Foundation. And that's what I've been doing for 30 years now is running that foundation. Its mission is to present a principled, uncompromising case for the libertarian philosophy. And I should emphasize that they're not endorsing my political campaign, but uh, last November I announced for the Libertarian Party presidential nomination, and so I'm now fighting in both the educational arena and the libert- and the um, political arena. Okay. And, um, and why are you running for president? One simple reason, Robert, I want to be free. And, and this is what one of the things that distinguishes us libertarians from non-libertarians is that we've broken through the indoctrination that, that teaches us all that we live in a free country, that we have a free enterprise system and all this other nonsense that we understand now that it was it's all been a lie. And, and that's one of the things that we libertarians understand, that we, we think in, in terms of human liberty in a much different way from non-libertarians. So I've been advancing liberty for 30 years in the educational arena, but I finally got to the point in my life where I said, you know, I want to take these people on in a more direct way, and that's in the political arena. And when I say these people, I mean both Democrats and Republicans. They're jointly responsible for the destruction of liberty in our country, as well as prosperity and health and, and our monetary system, immigration. I mean, everywhere you look, they have made a total mess of things. Now, I'm not really familiar with the process, but have you selected a running mate yet? Uh, no, because that's not the way the Libertarian Party works, is that uh, our, while we're, we are in certain primaries, like on Super Tuesday, we're in primaries, uh, and we were in caucuses like Iowa and Minnesota, the, um, they're, not, they're not binding on the delegates. And the way our system works is that each state uh, convention elects delegates that then go to the national convention and the national convention, which will consist of about a thousand delegates from all over the country, will elect the presidential candidate. Well, then when the vice presidential race comes up, they have the authority or the right to elect whoever they want to elect. Uh, the presidential candidate can say, hey, I'd like this person, but the, uh, the convention itself is going to decide the vice presidential nominee. I see. Um- now, before we get into policy and your philosophy, um, as I mentioned in the intro that the convention is supposed to be scheduled in May, um, is there a contingency if the Libertarian Convention, um, uh, if the coronavirus situation isn't cleared up by then? Uh, not yet. The Libertarian National Committee, which is the governing body of the party, is meeting any day now to think in terms of contingencies. And I, I would think the only viable contingency would be an online convention. And we we did that yesterday with the Massachusetts State Party. And it was the first one I had participated in. And we actually had a presidential debate online. 
yeah. that where the presidential candidates were you know, speaking on video live and debating with each other, and everything went off like clockwork. I mean, it was so well run. Uh, the delegates to the national convention were selected. Everybody was online, and they had, they were credentialed. So I would assume that type of thing could be done uh, with a thousand delegates, and then nationwide as well. Okay, let's let's go ahead and jump into some policy now. Um, even though it really hasn't been talked about very much and doesn't seem to be on most people's minds, at least recently, uh, clearly one of the more important issues is foreign policy. Uh, Jacob, how do you look at America's role in the world, and how would your foreign policy be different from, say, Donald Trump or Joe Biden? It would be totally different. Uh, there's really no difference between Biden and Trump. People had the impression that Trump was going to be different, that he was going to bring the troops home from Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. And, of course, that hasn't happened. I mean, he's actually doubled down in certain instances, and he's trying to start another war with uh, with Iran. He's got uh, bombings taking place in Yemen. Uh, he's got um, uh, soldiers fighting in Somalia. And that's exactly what Biden uh, would, would do, and it's exactly what Hillary Clinton would have done. Uh, no difference between uh, Hillary Clinton and, and, and Donald Trump on foreign policy, and for that matter, Barack Obama and George W. Bush. Uh, we libertarians are totally opposed to the concept of anti of interventionism. We are what what are called anti-interventionists, which of course was the founding foreign policy of America. It was our foreign policy for a hundred years, and what that says is that. You have a limited government republic with a basic military force that does not go abroad and, and be the world's policeman or get involved in civil wars like in, in, uh, in Vietnam or Korea. It just stays out of foreign interventionism entirely. So I favor bringing all the troops home, not just from the wars, Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria and Yemen and so forth. Bring them home from everywhere, Korea, Europe, World War II is over, Africa, Latin America bring them all home, and discharge them into the private sector. They're not necessary. If you have a non-interventionist foreign policy, you don't need all these interventionist troops. And then I'd go even a step further. Our government started as a limited government republic with a basic military force. That was converted after World War II into a national security state type of governmental structure. Massive Pentagon, CIA, NSA, this uh, military-industrial complex, this is a totalitarian form of governmental structure. North Korea is a national security state. So is China, Egypt, Russia, Cuba. That We have no business being a national security state. I would call on Congress to dismantle the national security state and restore a limited government republic to our land. Now, one action that the government takes pretty frequently are sanctions on countries we disagree with. <laughs> Do you consider sanctions an act of war? Oh, absolutely. And not only are they an act of war, they're, they're the epitome of immorality. I mean, uh, I, I, I have referred to them as, as the banality of evil. I mean, they really are evil. And, and the evil is, is being demonstrated right now, like with Iran, where they, they, the president has imposed sanctions on, on the Iranian people. So their economy has cratered. They're impoverished. Uh, not only because of the sanctions, but also because of their socialist economic system. But the sanctions have really aggravated it. And now they've got this coronavirus, and President Trump isn't even considering lifting his sanctions. I mean, it, it's it's almost like he's using this as a continuation of his foreign policy toward Iran. And the same with North Korea. I mean, we don't know what the coronavirus is there because it's a clamp down society, but there's no question that the they have to be suffering the same thing as everybody else. So the sanctions target the, the civilian population of a country for the purpose of a political end, like regime change, or to, or to force foreign officials to comply with U.S. government dictates. Well, that's what we condemn terrorism for, Robert. I mean, you know, the terrorists target civilians to achieve a political goal. So... A libertarian president would rescind every single executive order that established sanctions against foreign countries, and then at the same time request Congress to lift the embargo against Cuba, which has just been the other side of a vice with their socialist economic system that has squeezed the lifeblood out of the Cuban people. I mean, that, that embargo has gone on for, what, now over 50 years? Mm -hmm. And for what? What does it accomplish? Nothing. 
Uh, do you consider Iran an enemy, and how would you deal with it if you were elected president? Of course, I don't. Uh, Iran's not an enemy. This is uh, this is this is shows you what happens when you live under a national security state. Uh, this is a totalitarian form of governmental structure, and a national security state always needs enemies. Uh, it, it's just inherent to a national security state. North Korea has official enemies, principally the U.S. Well, so does this U.S. national security state. So they always need official enemies, whether it's Russia or China or Saddam Hussein or communism or terrorism or Muslims or Islam, and Iran falls in this category. Uh, I mean, you know, when you look at the U.S.-Iran relationship, you have to go back to 1953. The U.S. had just been converted to a national security state. The CIA had been called into existence in 1947. And they immediately, almost immediately, they come up with an assassination manual because that's an, another inherent part of national security states. And they affect a regime change operation in Iran where they oust the democratically elected uh, prime minister of the country, Mohammad Mossadegh, and then they install into power this dictatorial, unelected uh, Shah of Iran. And then they proceed to help train his, his police force, the Sabak, into torture, indefinite detention. It was it was a totally tyrannical regime, fully U.S. supported and trained, until the Iranian people finally said enough's enough, and that was when they revolted in 1979. And so, when people look at U.S.-Iran relations, it's important to recognize that the U.S. government has been the precipitating cause of these bad relations. Yeah, then they have a dictatorial regime. So what? There's a lot of dictatorial regimes in the world, including ones that the U.S. supports, like in Egypt. But I say, leave the Iranian people alone. Let them figure out the solution to their domestic problems. The only time you really have an enemy is is when you're in war. All this other nonsense of enemies and rivals and that type of thing, that's just empire talk. It's national security state talk. Yeah. <clears throat> Last foreign policy question. Should we be sending hard-earned tax dollars overseas in the form of foreign aid? Absolutely not. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, that's an interesting question, Robert, because it amazes me that hard-pressed American taxpayers, I mean, there's a lot of people that are unable to save money. They they don't have a nest egg. like to get them through this, this coronavirus crisis. Uh, and, and yet they don't object to their money being taken from them by the IRS and sent to these foreign dictators. It's really just welfare for, for dictators. Uh, this notion that, oh, it helps the poor is, is nonsense. Foreign aid is a bribe. It's a bribe to get foreign officials to do what U.S. officials want them to do. They put them on the dole, and then once they're dependent on the dole, they, they, they'll they comply with orders. And, and the dole inevitably ends up in the pockets of the dictators or in their the pockets of their military, or it reinforces the armaments they use to suppress their people and maintain their hold on power. I favor the immediate termination of all this foreign bribery, including every single regime overseas. There's absolutely no reason why American taxpayers should be funding any foreign regime at all. Well, while foreign policy hasn't been like high on the ladder of issues, though it should be, uh, health care definitely is, and uh, it will likely become a bigger issue as the current pandemic possibly wreaks havoc on our system. So I got three questions for you, Jacob. One, is health care a right? Well, it, no, it's a right to seek health care, but you don't have a right to health care, and there's, that's an important distinction. In other words, I, I have a right to walk into a doctor's office and ask to be treated. I don't have a right to go into the doctor's office and say, you treat me regardless whether you want to or not. Uh, so, yeah, I think there's an important distinction here as to seeking happiness as compared to happiness itself. Mm -hmm. And what should be the federal government's role in health care, if any? Uh, that's a critically important question. None. And, and this, is, this is the ultimate libertarian answer to everything that's going on here. Uh, Robert, I grew up in the poorest city in the United States. That was Laredo. And every day, this was before Medicare and Medicaid, every day doctor's offices were filled with patients. And they, the doctors knew that, that, that most of them could not pay. And, and 
Notwithstanding that, the doctors never turned away anyone. They always treated people, the poor, the wealthy alike. And the same with our hospital in town. It was called Mercy Hospital. It was a Catholic hospital. They treated the poor. It was all on a voluntary basis. And health care costs were so low and stable that nobody even had health care insurance. They didn't need health care insurance. Going to the doctors was like going to the grocery store. Uh, you know, who has health and who has grocery store insurance to protect against soaring grocery prices? Nobody. And that's the way it was. And doctors loved what they did. They had made house calls and innovations, inventions. So you had a totally a system on, based on total private charity. And doctors were still in Laredo, the second wealthiest people in town because the taxes were so low then. Um, well, then that Medicare and Medicaid come into existence. And that's the root of the problem. This massive artificial government imposed demand on the healthcare system. That's when healthcare costs started soaring. That's what caused the crisis. Then to, to double down on the crisis, they started enacting reform after reform until they finally got Obamacare, that that was supposed to reform the crisis, which I knew it wouldn't. And then so what do they want now? Well, a totally government run healthcare system like they have in Cuba or North Korea. There's only one solution to this. And I've been saying this for 30 years, Robert is a total separation of health care in the state. Just like we've separ- our ancestors separated church and state, no government involvement in health care at all. A totally vibrant free market system. The free market is our heritage. It produces the best of everything. And the centrally planned, centrally cult- controlled health care system is a nightmare. And we're now seeing the results of that in the midst of this coronavirus scandal. Yeah. Uh, crisis. No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm on the same page with you, but Unfortunately, I think in our future, we're going to see this Medicare for all thing taking place. I mean, do you disagree with that? Uh, well, the jury's out. I mean, that's certainly the tendency. But I mean, I mean, that's why I'm running through this office is I, I want to let people know you have a choice here. It's not just a choice between Tweedledum and Tweedledee, between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, who stand for the exact same philosophy. I mean, if people like the direction that America is going in, then vote for either one of them. It doesn't make any difference. They they just play musical chairs. They're really one party, the welfare warfare party, divided into two wings. The reason I'm running and I'm hoping to get this nomination is to let people know, okay, you have a choice here. I'm offering you a way of life that's based on your heritage of economic liberty, health health liberty, monetary liberty, uh, that that. It separates health care in the state. It gets government out. It gets rid of Medicare and Medicaid and occupational licensure and Obamacare and, and government control, the, you know, the, the government central planning of, of health. So, okay, people have a choice. Right now, they don't realize that there's a choice here. They think, oh, well, we have a free enterprise system, Jacob, so we have to have socialism now in this health care system. They don't realize that you already have a socialist system. That's why there's, you have this mass chaos with shortage of test kits and shortage of masks. And that's just what socialism does. It produces what Libby Igman Mises calls planned chaos. I mean, what better term to describe what's going on today? And it's always enforced by tyranny. I mean, whenever you have a socialist system, you're going to have a police state right behind it. So there's a choice here, Robert. Might people say, Jacob, we want fully socialized medicine? Sure. Okay. But live with the consequences. You know that there's a choice now, and that's a free market health care system. Right. And that really leads me into my next question is, how would a Hornberger administration be dealing with this current coronavirus situation? Well, the important thing is, is that libertarianism doesn't purport to be a philosophy that, that shows status, people that look to the government to solve all their social problems, how, to work, how it works. I mean, people would hit us with that sometimes in the educational thing and say, okay, how would you make public schooling work? And we said, well, that's not our philosophy. We can't tell you how to make your system work. So you've got a really dysfunctional system right now. You've got a dysfunctional economic system that's centrally planned where President Trump considers himself the master central planner. And then you've got a dysfunctional health care system, uh, which is a centrally planned, centrally managed health care system. You've got a centrally planned and managed monetary system demonstrated by the Federal Reserve. Well, now you have this perfect storm of all three dysfunctional systems coming together. So a libertarian can't say, well, here, here's how you make this work. That what we really need to do is think long-term here. 
what what is the solution to get a healthy society so that when a crisis like this hits and this is not going to la- be the last pandemic um I, everything i read is saying this is just one of many that are going to come you know how do you get a healthy economy how do you get that doesn't involve all these bubbles bursting and the fed destroying our monetary system how do you get a healthy health care system well i would advocate a total separation of of the economy in the state, a, a way of life where people keep everything they earn, no IRS anymore, no income tax. Everybody keeps everything they earn, and charity is 100% voluntary. Oh, by the way, that was our system. That's our heritage for more than 100 years. Uh, a total separation of health care in the state where we, we had the dynamics of a free market health care system. If we had a free market health care system, you would not see shortage of masks, shortage of tests, you would be seeing a vibrant healthcare industry responding immediately to this pandemic. And then a, mo- a sound monetary system, one that isn't involved with destroying money, inflating money, and creating recessions and depressions. And so that's what a libertarian president brings to the table. Let's change the paradigm here for the future. Uh, you know, it's, it's difficult to deal with this crisis with these dysfunctional systems, but let's think long term and get a healthy foundation for this country. Yeah, and they're, they're and they're talking about trillions of dollars in bailouts and subsidies right now. Um, there's a lot of real damage that's going to occur both in the short and the long run from this, don't you think? Economically. Oh, it's horrendous. Yeah. Oh, it's horrendous. I mean, we're all, uh, the, the U.S. government was already running uh, under the Trump administration. Now, the big spender Trump, who decried Hillary Clinton for she was going to be a big spender, this is a guy that is spending $1 trillion more than what he was bringing in. And, and, and wasn't saving him at all. So that's another trillion dollars added on to the national debt. That's, that would be 23 to 24 trillion. Now they're saying, oh, we're going to give away another trillion dollars here? Or two trillion? Where are they going to get this money? They're going to suck it out of the private sector because that's because they're going to have to borrow it. So that's the damage right there that they're sucking all this money out of the private sector that has to be paid back with taxation. So now the debt's at twenty six, twenty seven trillion dollars. In the process, the Fed is flooding the the system with with just newly printed money. We, they've already destroyed the fine. We had the finest monetary system in history. It was a gold coin, silver coin standard. It was established by the Constitution. Uh, it, no state was supposed to make anything but gold and silver legal tender. That was one of the major contributing factors to the tremendous increase in the standard of living of the American people in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The Fed ends up destroying the system, and they are essentially completing the destruction of this thing. Now, notice something important here. Look at Italy, where you have this massive death toll. In, in, in the coronavirus crisis. Notice two things about Italy. Massive government spending and debt, which is very close to bankruptcy for them, and two, a centrally controlled, centrally managed healthcare system. I mean, I think the only reason that why the death toll is still relatively low as compared to Italy here in the United States is that you still have some remnants of, of liberty in all these areas. You don't have the total centrally managed and control system like you do in, in, in Italy. Yeah, you've already touched on the Fed a little bit, but, you know, on your website, you, know, you bring up the issue of the Fed that nobody running for president has brought up since 2012. Um, can you explain your position? Because I don't think a lot of people truly understand this issue and the damage that the Fed does. Yeah, it, it is horribly damaging. And I, I think it's arguably even more damaging than the, than the Internal Revenue Service. I mean, one thing that the American people discovered throughout the 1800s and early 1900s was the key to wealth. I mean, we often hear about the, the, the causes of poverty. Well, poverty is the natural state of mankind. The real question is, what is it that causes people in a society to be wealthy, higher standards of living, especially for the poor? And one of those was the accumulation of capital. So when Americans were free to keep everything they earned and charity was 100% voluntary, and by the way, Americans became the most charitable nation in history, that's what we need to recapture in this country is that sense of voluntary charity, that you had this huge increase in the standard of living compared to the rest of the world. Well, part of this was sound money. 
that that people knew that when they had these gold coins and silver coins that they were solid gold, solid silver. You, you can look at them now, a $20 St. Gaudens piece or an American Eagle silver uh, silver eagle. Uh, I mean, these these were solid monetary units that contributed to to the economic prosperity because people could plan that you know corporations would issue a hundred year debt payable in gold coin and have no problems with people buying them because they knew that they could not inflate them out of existence. Well, the Fed comes along, which is a socialist institution. It, it's it's involved with central planning of the monetary field. This was 1913. And immediately, there's catastrophe. I mean, they produce what, what Ludwig von Mises calls planned chaos. They're the cause of the 1929 stock market crash, the Federal Reserve. Now, we're told that, oh, it's a failure of free enterprise. Well, this is nonsense. It was the failure of the Federal Reserve, and then they used that as the excuse for this massive transformation of American society into a welfare warfare state. And so, during this, from then on, uh, from the 30s on, you've got massive income taxation, and you've got massive printing of money by the Fed to finance this ever-growing welfare warfare state. So what the Fed started doing was just essentially a complex process, but essentially printing money, which – and then Roosevelt nationalized the gold, which forced every American to turn in what had been the official money of the country for 100 years and made it a felony offense. I mean, it was no different from what the communists were doing, nationalizing uh, people's property. And then gradually over time, they, they ran the silver coins out of business. When I was a kid, you, you were still transacting business with silver quarters, silver dollars and stuff. But after a while, there was so much overabundance of printed Federal Reserve notes that we carry around in our billfolds now that it drove silver out of circulation. And, and that, what people don't realize, is the destruction. It, it's essentially a tax. When the Federal Reserve is inflating the currency, it's causing prices to rise across society, making things more expensive, which is a tax. But it's a secret tax, the surreptitious tax that people don't understand. They blame it on the rapacious businessmen or big oil. They don't understand that it's the Federal Reserve that is plundering and looting them to finance this racket known as the welfare warfare state. What we really need to do is what Ron Paul said in his two campaigns in the Fed, dismantle it, get rid of it and have a total free market monetary system. And this was outlined by a Nobel laureate libertarian economist named Friedrich Hayek in an essay called The Denationalization of Money. A free market monetary system. It's the only solution to what's going on. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me switch gears here. And um, Now, abortion has been an issue in libertarian circles as long as I can remember. And there's... Ballpark, a 50-50 split on the viewpoints, uh, pro-abortion versus anti-abortion. Um, where do you stand on this very important and divisive issue, and is there a federal role? Yeah, uh, there is a split in the party. I, I served on the platform committee for the National Party three terms in the 1990s, and I think the, the split was around 65-35% pro-choice. I'm a Catholic. I believe that life begins at conception, and so I'm pro-life. Um, but I, I, I just I don't put a lot of faith in the criminal justice system to to achieve what what I think a lot of us would like to see, and that's fewer abortions. Um, for one thing, putting people in jail for an abortion is after the fact. Uh, it's it's the, the abortion's already committed, so you haven't really achieved anything by putting the woman in jail or the doctor in jail in terms of what you're trying to achieve, and that's fewer abortions. Now, is there a deterrent effect? Possibly, but from what I can tell, it doesn't seem to be much of a deterrent effect. I, I don't think there's a federal government role in this um, because, in a, in a sense, what we're dealing with is a murder case. So this is traditionally state law enforcement. Well, you know, some states are going to criminalize it. Others are not. Uh, women that want an abortion will just travel to the states, assuming they can afford it, that permits the abortion. Or women go back to the coat hanger days. So I, I really think that if we want to achieve fewer abortions, and that's what I would love, is, is it's an educational task. I mean, there's, there's a lot of groups, counseling groups that counsel young women about going to term with a baby. I, I think that if economic conditions uh, were to improve through libertarian policies, 
that 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 financial aspect of it would would cause women to uh, go to term where they say, well, gosh, I can't afford to bring up this child. I, so I think that factor would, would be eliminated. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's just we, we, it's it's an educational thing where we're trying to raise people's consciousness of let's 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 let people be born, and uh, that's the ultimate solution. I think it's an educational one. Right, right. Okay, now here here's a question for you: If elected president of the United States, what could you do uh, to get this obscene spending under control? I mean, you can veto all these big spending bills, but th- won't they override your veto anyway? Uh, absolutely, but but he, here's where a libertarian president could really be effective in, in terms of saving money. I already mentioned bringing all the troops home and discharging because now all of a sudden all those troops overseas and all the stuff they're doing and all the tanks that have to be replaced and the airplanes that have to be replaced and repair all that's over and and they're discharging the private sector so that saves gobs of money right there. No more salaries. And expenses for this uh, overseas war machine. Also, start dismantling much of the uh, domestic military empire of the president. You're the commander in chief. You can you can start laying off people. And, and notice, nobody's trying to invade the United States. All this crisis stuff is way over there. And so uh, that that's that would save a lot of money. Uh, but here here's the other critical factor. You know, every three years or so, you get the uh, the the debt ceiling coming up, and that's a ceiling that says that debt too much debt is a very bad thing. It's a dangerous thing, and that's that's why Congress imposes a ceiling. But we all know what happens. The debt ceiling's reached, and the president caves and says, "Okay, let's have three more years of, of borrowing," and that in those three years, nobody in Congress says, well, gosh, you know, we've, we've got this new debt ceiling coming up. We need to slash spending to prepare for it. They just act business as normal. And you saw this with Trump. Trump, you know, goes with the, the closure of the government and all this hype. But everybody knew he was going to cave. Republicans always cave. And so he did. Well, OK, a libertarian president says when the debt ceiling's coming up, that's it. There's no more debt. That's the ceiling. And they say, well, the government's going to have to close. Yeah, I guess it is. And the libertarian doesn't blink. Let the government close the so-called non-essential functions. And it stays closed. And you force the government to live within its means. No more borrowing. It's cash on delivery. And that's, I think, where a president can really cause federal spending to to be constrained. Hmm. All right, let, let, let me do a few quickie Q&A questions for you. Just, a, you know, a couple sentences, answers if you can. Getting the federal government out of education. Education. Well, not only the federal government out of education, get all governments at all levels out of education, state, local, uh, a total free market educational system. The free market produces the best of everything, and that's why you have this perpetual crisis in education because government's involved in it. Yeah, student loan forgiveness. No, this is this this is a, an, an obligation that has been incurred. It's unfair to people that use their own savings uh, and struggle to get their kids through co- uh, through college without. And uh, I would say absolutely not. Right. Abolish the EPA immediately. It's a tyrannical agency. The, you know, we libertarians care about the environment which is precisely why we don't want to put it in the hands of the government. The federal government is good at one thing, and that's destroying. And to entrust environmental issues to them is is just weird. You entrust environmental issues in the private sector, private ownership. You know, I told you I grew up in South Texas. You go to any, any, any South Texas ranch, and I will guarantee you that ranch owner keeps that place in pristine condition. It, 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 even if he has an oil company drilling wells on there. He's very careful with that oil company, making sure that they do everything right. Private ownership is the solution to our uh, environmental problems. The more we can privatize waterways and other things, that's the key. Now, you talked about getting rid of the federal income tax and the IRS. Um, How do we we finance the government? Well, keep in mind that if you eliminate all of the illegitimate functions of government, 
we're uh, the federal government. We're talking about a very tiny government here, uh, and I'm talking about all welfare state programs. Every single program that takes money from one person and gives it to another person, get rid of it. Uh, which, of course, is most of the government. I mean, that's the primary function of the federal government since the 1930s. Corporate bailouts, uh, farm subsidies, education grants, foreign aid to dictators, Social Security, Medicare, get rid of it all. Total 100% voluntary charitable society. Then you dismantle the, the national security state and you restore a limited government republic you're getting rid of at least like 14 out of the 16 departments of the federal government. So you're left with a, and you, and you leave criminal justice to the states and the, and the local governments. Get rid of the FBI. You don't need it. Just leave criminal justice at the state and local level. That's what federalism and decentralization of power are all about. So, okay, how do you fund this tiny percentage of, of expenditures, which was essentially our, our government, a basic military force throughout the 1800s, early 1900s. Well, our, our founders used what were called indirect taxes because they, they understood the tyranny that comes with direct taxation, like income taxation, uh, the IRS. So they, they favored indirect taxation, like a sales tax or an excise tax or a tariff, which is not so intrusive. But my own, so I think that's the second best system. But my own ideal is that the freest society in history, one of these days, Robert, will be the one where people can be counted on to just voluntarily support the government because they believe in the government. They believe the police are an important thing, just like they support churches voluntarily. I think that's what I would ultimately aim for is a totally voluntary uh, federal government, voluntary state government, and 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 local government. And then if government's doing bad things, people can withhold their donations. But I, I think that's the only the only real key to a free society where everything's voluntary. And you mentioned Social Security. So how do, how do you wean us off of that? And I mean, the president does have sole authority to do that, or or does he? No, he doesn't. He'd have to go to Congress and seek a repeal which obviously would not be an easy task, but it's a necessary task. That, you see, if I get this nomination, I, I'm going to pose two questions to the American people that I hope they will discuss and debate during the course of this campaign. Number one, what does it truly mean to be free? And number two, what is the legitimate role of government in a free society? Is it legitimate for government to take money from one person and give it to another person? Is it legitimate for government to force people to be good and caring? And I say the answer is no to both those questions. Now, there's no fund. This is not a retirement fund. People have deceived themselves, especially seniors, into thinking, oh, I put it in. I'm just getting it back. No, you're not. Your money's gone. It was spent on the Vietnam War and the Iraq War and all this other stuff. The money is coming from the young people of this country. Now, why do young people, this is the question young people have to answer, and this I'm talking about people 50 and, and below, why do they need to be forced to be good and caring? And the answer that, that Democrats and Republicans give them is because they're bad, because they can't be trusted with freedom. And, and they, they won't honor their mother and father if their mother and father get sick, or they won't help out a needy person. Well, I reject that. I think people can be trusted with freedom, and I have no doubt that freedom works. So I favor the complete, immediate repeal of Social Security. I'm hit with this, oh, Jacob, you're not caring and compassionate. Oh, really? Where is the care and compassionate? You're, you're talking about the Internal Revenue Service? That's your care and compassion? It's like vicarious care and compassion. And people think, well, yeah, as long as I favor the IRS going and stealing all this money from people, I'm a caring and compassionate person. That's nonsense. I favor a system where everybody keeps everything he earns and people can be trusted with freedom. There's no doubt in my mind that the overwhelming number of young people in this country will step up to the plate and help their parents and their grandparents, especially when they have this immediate raise where there's no more withholding, there's no more income taxation, there's no more FICA. They, they're keeping this huge amount of money that they're paying in taxes. And this is what we're talking about, Robert, in terms of freedom and charity, 100% system based on voluntary charity. That was our heritage. That was our way of life for more than 100 years. And that's what I'm fighting to restore. Um, let me talk, ask you an important, a very important question to me, and, and it's abiding by your oath. 
um, defending the first, second, fourth, ninth, and tenth amendments and the rest of the Constitution. Can you um, talk about that for a second? Yeah, uh, the, the the Bill of Rights I think was one of the greatest achievements that our ancestors ever did. You know that they, they, if you had told the American people at 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 the, at the Constitutional Convention after they they came out from Philadelphia, keep in mind that they had gone into this convention with the ideas of of uh, uh, just modifying the Articles of Confederation. Now the Articles of Confederation are a a separate part a separate type of governmental system. Uh, they've been operating a, under it for more than 10 years, and the, the, the government, the federal government, get this, did not have the power to tax. We were just talking about that a minute ago. Here is a governmental structure where the Americans had not given the federal government the power to tax for more than 10 years. So when they went into the Constitutional Convention, they were figuring, well, there had been some problems with the articles. They're just going to modify them. Well, if they had come out of that convention and said, this is what we propose to you. We propose a gigantic welfare state with an IRS that can seize any portion of your income or whenever it wants, a mandatory charity system where you're going to be forced to be good and caring, and a national security state that's going to have the power to assassinate you, torture you, involve you in foreign uh, adventures and coups and assassinations and wars. They would have laughed. They would have thought it was a joke. I mean, they would have, and once they realized it was serious, they would have rejected the type of system we live under today and, and just continued operating under the Articles of Confederation. So when the Constitution was, was proposed, they said, no, you're, we're going to give you a limited government republic. There's going to be no IRS. You keep everything you earn. You get to travel wherever you want. There's going to be no you know, restrictions on travel, no drug war, no immigration controls, uh, no gun control, no drug war. They said, okay, we'll go with the deal because they said, well, these are the only powers the government will have. They, they just didn't trust government at all, and even a democratically elected government. Well, but the American people were very wise. They, they still didn't trust them, and they said, look, to make sure, we want a Bill of Rights. And, and it really should have been called a Bill of Prohibitions because they, it, we don't get our rights from the Bill of Rights. These, they prohibit government from interfering with our rights, and it's a good thing they did. Because if they did not have these restrictions on power, there is no doubt that today the federal government would be taking the people to jail without trial by jury, without right to counsel, torturing people. They'd be doing all the things that they're doing to people in Guantanamo Bay. So the fact that those express restrictions are there, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to keep and bear arms, was the best thing that our ancestors, ancestors ever did for us. Okay, this is just a curiosity question. Um, is there any place where you and Trump and or Biden have a meeting of the minds? No. 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 Okay. I mean, I have to say that Trump is better on gun rights than Biden is. Uh, but he – and so that there is a distinction there. But in terms of the overall philosophy of statism, of looking to the government to, to be the solution – to, to people's societal woes, they are on the exact same page. Uh, and you can see this in this corona uh, virus scandal. I mean, you know, we're going to give this and we're going to give that and we're going to have lockdowns and we're going to have tyranny here. And, and they're even shutting down ammunition and gun sales in certain places. I mean, Democrats and Republicans are all on the same page. So I would say there, there, there is a little bit of a difference on gun rights, but even even after a gun massacre, uh, Trump starts to waffle immediately and starts calling for expanded background checks and so forth. But when it comes to liberty, Robert, you cannot trust either of these people. And we see it. You know, crises and emergencies are the time-honored way where people lose their liberties. I mean, this is why there was no emergency exception in the Bill of Rights. Notice it doesn't say no person the, the to take life, liberty, and property without due process of law except in emergencies. They knew that emergencies are the place or the times where people lose their liberties because they're so afraid that they're, they're willing to surrender their liberties for this pretense of security, and then they end up without the security or the liberty. Uh, so Donald Trump and Joe Biden, uh, they're, they're birds of a feather flip sides of the same coin. If people want to move in a different direction, an entirely different direction, that, uh, you know, uh, in a direction of liberty, peace, prosperity, health, harmony, morality, Join up with us.
and specifically come and join my campaign because this is what we would do for America. If you like the direction that America is going in and has been going in, go ahead and vote for either Trump or Biden. You're going to get you're going to get the same thing regardless. Now, if someone wants to find out more about you and your campaign, where can they go? Well, they can go to the Future of Freedom Foundation, FFF.org, and uh, they can they can grasp. 30 years of articles, videos, conferences. They can get a sense of the work I've done for liberty and the passion that I have for liberty. Uh, now, again, they're not endorsing my campaign. They can't do that. They're a nonprofit foundation. Or people can go to jacobforliberty.com, which is my campaign website, and I've got a very active blog there and uh, appearances and posting a podcast like this one, lots of interviews. And then I've, I've published a campaign book, which is a sort of an – an autobiography to give people what my background is, how I discovered libertarianism, why I am convinced that libertarianism is the solution to America's problems, why it's the key to restoring liberty in our land and prosperity and health, and that's called My Passion for Liberty. Right now, it's only in Kindle format on Amazon. We're, we're working on getting it in print format, but that those three things will give people a really good idea of what I'm presenting to the American people as part of this libertarian campaign for president. Well, excellent. I'll go ahead and link to those things in the show notes when I publish the podcast. And I want to thank you, Jacob Hornberger, for sharing your time and your thoughts with us today. Best of luck and uh, stay healthy. Oh, thanks. And and likewise, and, and thanks uh, to your listeners for tuning in. I'm very appreciative. All right. Thanks, Jacob. You're welcome. Thank you, Robert.